Hi, I'm Jonathan Edwards, and I want to welcome you to the Jed Breaks Bread podcast. My goal in this podcast is to teach the truth of the Word of God and apply it to our lives that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed. Welcome back, my friends. Thanks again for joining me on the podcast. We are continuing our series on the creation ordinance, and as we discussed in the last couple episodes about the ordinance of dominion and authority, we are now going to begin looking at some specific spheres of authority that God has established. All right, so God has established these various spheres of authority, and hopefully you got a chance to listen to that particular episode. The sphere of authority that we want to look at more closely today is the government's sphere of authority. So in other words, what authority did God give to human governments? Why were they established? And is there any reason to disobey a governmental authority? So we're going to try to answer those particular issues in this episode. First of all, we find that the foundations, the early foundations for human government were established in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, after the flood. Okay, so I'm a literalist when it comes to the Bible, and I believe the Bible is a literal work. And so I believe that, yes, God created in six literal days. I believe that there was a literal worldwide flood that affected all of the earth and it affected the land of the earth it affected every every aspect of the earth was affected by this flood and there were eight persons who survived and it was noah and his family so noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives they are the ones who survived the flood and after they survived the flood God gave some instructions to Noah and his children concerning governance of one group of human beings to another. Now, you'll recall, before the flood, God said that man was wicked continually and did evil all the time. That might be a bit of a paraphrase, but it communicates the main idea that man was evil and committed evil acts towards one another. And as a result of that, God looked with regret upon how mankind was treating one another and decided to judge them because every sinner deserves the punishment of death. That is the appropriate punishment for sin. All that being said, God allowed Noah and his family, because they were righteous, okay? Noah was a man of faith, to escape the flood, to escape the judgment. And then when they were going to reestablish humankind, when they were going to repopulate the earth and multiply, God gave a command concerning how humans treat one another. And here's the command. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. As for you, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. If you recall back in Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 5, the stories of Cain and the story of Lamech, both men were murderers, both men escaped what we would consider to be a just punishment for murder, and both experienced a curse that God put upon them. Now, we don't understand why God dealt with these men the way that he did at that particular time. But what we do understand is that after the flood, God is changing the parameters and giving man authority over the life of other men. And this is the very beginning and foundation of governmental authority. And it concerns primarily this issue of murder. So if one man murders another man or one woman murders another woman, the consequence of that murder, the just result 
for that murder should be that that person who committed the murder forfeits his or her own life. That's what the text says. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And so in a unique way that wasn't present earlier in biblical history, God is now establishing a authority whereby man is able to exert power over other men to keep the peace. All right, so they're not murder and then a revenge murder and then a revenge murder and another murder. No, all men will be able to witness the the just punishment of the murderer, which is the loss of the murderer's life, however that might be. There's a number of ways that murderers have been executed throughout history, and it doesn't really matter which method of execution you use. It should be swift, though. It should be humane. But it doesn't really matter what the method of execution is, as long as the murderer is tried and found guilty of shedding man's blood, he should have his own blood shed. He has forfeited his life. And one of the main consequences of this is that it makes people fear sin. They fear the consequence of sin. And so this is an important early foundation for human governments. It not only protects the image of God, which every man and woman is made in the image of God, but it also helps to put a appropriate fear into the heart of sinners so that they know if I sin in this certain way, I will forfeit my own life. And this capital punishment helps to promote peace within society. Okay? So, God, um, in his infinite wisdom, established this as the first command that was kind of a cornerstone for human government. And as we understand the doctrine of progressive revelation, we know that God you know, communicates something, and then maybe a few hundred years later or, or longer, he reveals another thing, and then he reveals another thing. And these truths build upon each other so that, you know, where we are right now with the completed canon of Scripture, we have all of God's revelation that He desires to give us. Nothing is missing. Nothing is incomplete. There are no mysteries yet to be revealed, like Paul in the New Testament was writing about mysteries that needed to be revealed. Therefore, we can start in the book of Genesis and we can trace the foundation of human government from Genesis all the way through to the New Testament. And while I think that would be a fascinating historical study, I really don't have time or, nor, or the desire to trace that entire history in this particular podcast. It is sufficient to say that here in Genesis 9, we see the foundational cornerstone of human government being established. And because we have the advantage of the New Testament and living in the New Testament era, I just want to fast forward, if you will, all the way to Romans chapter 13, and let's look at what Paul says the purpose of government is in the New Testament. And this is, this is a completed revelation. So this is the purpose of government, not just for the first century and New Testament times, but this is a purpose of government that was established by God, revealed by Paul, and is true for all cultures and all times. Okay, that's what the New Testament is. It is a cross-cultural book. So let's go to Romans chapter 13. Okay, so here we are in Romans chapter 13, and I'm going to just begin reading in verse 1. I think it's really important to read the biblical text and then talk about the biblical text. This is not Jonathan's opinion. It's not anybody else's opinion. It's what does God say in his word, and how do we practice what God says? That's what we're aiming to do in this podcast. Okay, Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. (laughs) 
Now, let's just stop right here. What does Paul establish here in this first two verses of Romans chapter 13? He establishes this, that every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. That is, there is a sub-regent, okay? There is a sub-regent to God's overarching rule. So God is the supreme regent. He is the supreme ruler of the universe. And he has, in his wisdom, delegated sub-regents, which are sub-rulers. They are subject to him, but they rule over other portions of the creation. So the governing authorities are sub-regents to God. And notice, Paul doesn't make any distinction between Jewish governing authorities or Gentile governing authorities or good governing authorities or evil governing authorities. He just says there are governing authorities. God has established them. If you're familiar with Old Testament history, you can look uh, specifically at the book of Daniel and see how God used wicked kings to accomplish his purposes and godly kings to accomplish his purposes. You can see how God um, uses governments to advance redemptive history, and he's still doing that today. And part of the way that governments advance redemptive history is they keep order. And look at this. They have authority. You see, governing authorities have authority. And every person is to be in subjection to the governing authority. To be subject to somebody else means that you are going to voluntarily yield to their authority. You may not agree with what they say. You may have a different way of doing things. You may not exactly like what they say. But because you're going to honor God, you are going to voluntarily yield to these governing authorities. That's what you're going to do. You're going to submit yourself to their laws and to their decrees and to the way that they manage the country. Now, what's important about this is that you are only subject to your own government. For example, I live in the United States of America. I am subject to the laws of the United States of America on a federal level, but I'm also subject to the laws of the state of Ohio, which is where I live in the States. And then you're also subject to maybe your local municipality. So I could tell you I'm subject to the laws of my county or my city. You are subject to each governing authority according to the power and the extent of their authority. Now, here's what I am not subject to. I am not subject to the laws of Great Britain. I'm not subject to the laws of Germany or to Canada or to Mexico. Why? Because I'm not a Canadian citizen or a resident or a citizen of the United Kingdom or of Germany. I'm, I'm not a citizen of those countries. Now, if I were to visit those countries, I would have to obey their laws. But right now, I don't have to obey their laws because I'm subject to my own governing authorities. You see how this works? This is a voluntary yielding of your will to the decrees and the laws that exist over you. Now look at what Paul says here in verse 2. This is really important. He goes all the way back, in my, in my estimation, this is my interpretation of the text, and I think it's correct. He goes all the way back to creation by referencing the ordinances of God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. You recall that in our first discussion on the creation ordinance of authority, the creation ordinance of dominion, that God established dominion in creation. And the original dominion that was established was man, mankind, over the animal kingdom. Well, that wasn't the only authority that God established. We have learned from progressive revelation that he established other authorities. But there is the ordinance. That is what Paul is pointing to. Paul is pointing to this principle that God has established authorities and every person must be in subjection to the appropriate authorities. Now let's talk about why. Why are we in subjection to these authorities? 
Well, first of all, God has placed us there. This is the will of God. And so for me to reject the authority of the government is to reject the will of God. It is to reject the plan and purpose of God. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, what if my government's evil? Or what if my government asks me to do something that the Bible doesn't say, or says that I should not do? I will answer those questions. Don't worry. But as much as it depends upon you, to the extent that you possibly can, you should obey the authority of the government that is over you. Now, what is the purpose of their authority? Look at what Paul says the purpose is. And this is the ideal, okay? This is, this is what God's ideal is. I'm not saying every government lives up to this. Many of them don't, but this is God's ideal. Romans 13.3, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. So if you're an evildoer, you should fear the government. If you're doing what is good, you should not fear the government. Listen to what the text says. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For it, that is the government, is a minister of God to you for your good. I, the word minister, I think, throws people off there. Okay, because we don't really know what a minister is. We think of a minister as a pastor, but the word minister in the Greek language actually means servant. The government is a servant of God. It means God, it, he is God's servant. Okay, the government is God's servant to you for your good. So ideally, your government should be acting in your best interest, it should be promoting that which is good and peaceable, and according to God's moral law. And the government should not be promoting that which is evil. It should, in fact, be stopping that which is evil. It should be discouraging that which is evil. And what is the government's means for discouraging that which is evil? Look at the second half of verse 4. If you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a, again, servant of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. That phrase, bear the sword, means that the government has the power and the authority given to it by God to determine what types of consequences it will enact upon people who break the law. One of the consequences that we found out about way back in Genesis chapter uh, 9 is that if you commit a capital offense, you should lose your life. What's a capital offense? A capital offense is murder. Murder is a capital offense. So if you commit murder, you should lose your life. And then if we were to actually look at what God's standards were in the Old Testament law that he gave to Israel, you would find out that there are other capital offenses that result in you, the individual, losing your life. Other examples include rape, and there are other things that God has delineated as well. And I'm not going to spend the time to go through all those things, but those are some examples of offenses that government has been given the authority to regulate and to enforce so that peace reigns in society. You know, I love what Paul writes in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2 when he talks about praying publicly. He, he, asks, Tim, Ty, he asks Timothy, sorry, I'm preaching from the book of Titus, so I'm getting my T's confused here. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul asks Timothy to pray for the governing authorities. Why? So that they would make godly, God-honoring decisions, and that the people of God would be able to live peaceful and quiet lives. You know, when the government practices the moral laws that God has established, and when the government enforces those laws, it generally results in peace for everybody in society. However, when the government disregards those laws, when the government chooses to act against those moral laws. We're talking about God's moral laws in this case. Generally, confusion results and injustices occur 
and problems are exacerbated and sin is allowed to flourish. And in fact, what happens is people who are sinners start calling the righteous people wicked. And so the those who promote evil and who do evil are the good ones, and those who want to restrain evil are the evil ones. Paul says this is true. He writes about it in Romans chapter 1. We can see it from Israel's own history when we read Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 5, that those who um, are wicked and depraved will call evil good and good evil. Government is not supposed to do that. Government is supposed to be a servant of God for the good of the people. And as a servant of God, government ought to enforce and regulate the moral laws that God has established. Now, we know that governments are imperfect. God knew that governments are imperfect because they are operated by uh, men who are unbelievers. They're non-Christians. Now, sometimes there are Christians in government, but most of the time, governments are operated by individuals who don't know God. That doesn't mean that we cannot submit to them. Just because the governing authorities don't know God doesn't mean that we ought not to submit to them. We should submit to them. We should submit to them. So let's take a look then at how we should be in subjection. Verse 5, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath. So if you're not in subjection to the government, the government may turn their wrath upon you because you disobeyed. So you're not acting just because of fear, but you're also acting in subjection for conscience sake. Why the conscience? Because the conscience is what motivates you to do what is good and pleasing in the eyes of God. The conscience is that part of you that has been created within you by God and which the Holy Spirit energizes to convict you of sin or to, alternatively, say that you have not sinned in a certain area. Now, the conscience is something that can be trained to be very sensitive. Uh, it can, you can cultivate an unbiblical conscience, a, a conscience that is, that is hypersensitive. In, in other words, your conscience is, uh, thinks that things are sin, which God does not say are sin. Or your conscience can be seared. That means that your conscience has no longer activated itself or it has stopped activating by saying, hey, this thing which I know is sinful is actually not sinful anymore. I've, I've broken my conscience so many times, I'm not even bothered by this sin. Or you can have a biblically trained conscience. And that's what we should strive for as Christians, to have a conscience that is trained according to the truths of God's Word, whereby when we are reading the Word of God, when we are studying its truth, our conscience is learning and growing, and we are cultivating healthy relationships with the truth and the practice of the truth. And our conscience, therefore, is kind of like a guide in a sense. It's not the absolute guide. I don't mean that in the sense of like secular philosophy, but it is a guide. It's kind of like guardrails. It keeps you on course, okay? So it's necessary to be in subjection to the government to avoid the wrath of the government, but also for the sake of your conscience, because you know it's the right thing to do. It keeps you in line. Here's what Paul says you will do. If you are going to submit to the government for the sake of conscience, you are going to pay taxes, okay? You're going to give to all men what is due them. Verse 7. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, and honor to whom honor is due. These, these truths, they are difficult to master. And, and I have to say that when we consider the, the ways that our government, our, I'm talking about the federal government of the United States, when we look at the ways that our federal government has purposefully desecrated the moral laws of God and has spat on them and has rejected them 
and has basically kicked them out of the public discourse, that makes us angry. And it makes you not want to submit. But if you are going to obey God, you should submit to the governing authorities anyhow. Because they still have authority. That authority has been given to them by God. And I think that this is going to lead very well into what we talk about in our next episode. When do we not submit to a governing authority? At what point do we not submit to a sphere of authority that God has established? So, sorry to keep you on the edge of your seats, but you can tune in next week to get the other part or the answer to the question, at what point do I not submit to an authority that was established by God? Thanks for listening. I pray that your thoughts have been challenged and that you would do a great job of honoring Jesus as you submit to the various spheres of authority in the local governments that you reside under. God bless you.